Hello, welcome to The Fix. My name's Aaron Mastani, and as is frequently the case, although not nearly enough, I'm joined by Ash Sark at IOC. How are you doing, Ash? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We're talking about some very relevant things tonight. We're talking about climate change. Obviously, it's been a, a, an exceptional, an unprecedented uh, couple of weeks in terms of extreme uh, climate events in North America. We had uh, Houston, which was meant to be a once in 25,000 year storm, but actually in some parts it was a once in 500,000 years. Uh, meanwhile, in San Francisco, we saw uh, the all time temperature record crushed by three degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the highest temperature on record ever there. And then, of course, we had wildfires. There's a, a great image of this, actually, if we can cut to this, in Oregon uh, of a wildfire as uh, people are playing golf. It's a great image. If you can't see it, well, it can come later. We'll talk about it again. Yeah, there it is. Um, which, again, really, uh, really remarkable, kind of unprecedented in terms of how quickly it spread. And then, of course, there was Hurricane Irma. That's how you say it? I was calling it Irma. Uh, maybe I'm just, you know, I've said, I've said uh, Irma. Okay, I heard it was Irma because, like, um, that's, like, slang for... Okay, don't worry about what that's But I always for. get words. James is always correcting me with words, right? There was Hurricane Irma, um, which was an incredibly powerful... Hurricane, it's gone through the Caribbean, it went through Necker Island with Richard Branson, and then it's ended up uh, in Florida. Uh, here's a video, let's have a look at this. This is pretty phenomenal. The actual hurricane itself is just so, so huge. I was reading somewhere that the energy generated by the hurricane in some was akin to a third of the total energy consumption of the entire planet last year in terms of human demand. There was one estimate that showed that it was literally the size of Ohio. Wow, that's pretty big. That's pretty big. I think because, yeah, we're talking petawatts of energy, huge amounts of energy. What's a petawatt? I think it's like a million watts of energy. I think. Jeez. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There's a kilowatt and then there's a terawatt and a petawatt. Um, and then, of course, there was uh, an 8.1 uh, earthquake in Mexico City. We'll cut to a video of that. That was really, really frightening as well. I mean, I don't think that many people died from it. I think like maybe a couple of dozen people died from it. Okay. But normally, 8.1 looks pretty monstrous. That was also uh, a consequence of these uh, storms coming through, through the Caribbean. So this is remarkable. These are meant to be extreme weather events once in 250 years, once in 25,000 years, once in 500,000 years, and yet they're all happening on top of one another, which would suggest, as climate scientists have been saying for decades, that climate change a warming climate has an impact on the hydrological cycle and makes extreme weather events more common. Now, we'll talk about the science more in a second, but Ash, there is an industry around climate denial. I mean, okay? I wanted to And what's, what's pushing that? And will it continue, given the glaringly obvious fact that man-made climate change is making extreme weather events more and more common? I mean, I want to talk a bit about the political function of climate change denialism, which is basically the idea that you can put down global warming, if it does exist, to natural rather than man-made causes. And I've been seeing people sharing this tweet which says, well, you know, you can believe that God created Adam and Eve and the dinosaurs and all the rest of it, but you can't believe in man-made climate change. And it kind of pits the issue of climate change denialism as one that is a contest between the forces of modernity, of reason, of science, and a kind of pre-modern, in general, in general, Christian, evangelical, magical thinking. And I think that this fails to look at the political efficacy of climate change denialism because it's not really about um, the place of man in relation to God or the place of man in the universe. Climate change denialism is about keeping us distracted from the, the more relevant conversation at hand, which is not does man-made climate change exist because mm. undoubtedly the answer at this point is yes. Mm. The conversation that we need to have is, well, what will it take to ameliorate cl climate change what forms of reparative justice in a political, social and economic level are necessary to um, address the uneven effects of climate change as they're being affected, as, as they're affecting countries right now. So of the 10 most vulnerable countries in terms of the climate change vulnerability index, all of them are in the global south. Mm. Six of them are in Africa. Uh, the others are Haiti, 
Philippines, Cambodia, and number one is Bangladesh. So these are all also formerly colonized countries. The point of Rush Limbaugh saying uh, Hurricane Irma is just a liberal media talking point, yeah, yeah. or indeed Ann Coulter saying in Miami they're more likely to die of boredom than they are of um, hurricane-related, I don't know, falling trees or roofs being ripped off. The point of this is to keep us stuck in a pointless conversation where we're trying to convince people who don't need to be convinced. They already know what's going on, but they've got vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Because the fact is, climate change denialism is very well funded by the hydrocarbon industry, right? They've got Republican politicians and journalists in their pocket to repeat these talking points time and time again. So... One of the things that I would like to do, certainly in this conversation, is address what concrete steps to addressing climate change will look like, because I'm sick of talking to these Botoxed fools mm. about whether or not it exists. Yeah, they shouldn't be allowed to uh, set the agenda of the conversation. We, sh we shouldn't be going, look, it exists, we are right. You're absolutely correct. We need to be talking about substantial political proposals in terms of dealing with it. Uh, there's a great Guardian article, uh, I think it was in 2013, and it showed that between 2002 and 2010, $120 million was given to, uh, this is the article here, I think, uh, given to climate change denying, you know, think tanks and lobby groups and so on. And yeah, it's a, it's a huge industry and it has, you know, very clear connections with uh, hydrocarbons, big energy, vested interests in the United States. And I think the political response has to be ignoring these people uh, and just hammering this point home. And... That's one problem, right? These people, these vested interests are one problem. But in the last five years, that's come up against a liberal sensibility, which inherently wants to say, well, you're, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. Uh, we have to have journalistic balance. The extent where somebody like you know, climate change deniers are on the BBC Today programme, we know scientifically since the 1860s, the world is now 0 0.8 degrees warmer than it was then. We know that, you know? Like you wouldn't have somebody saying that dinosaur, there's no like fossils of dinosaurs or that uh, you know, water isn't composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Like, these aren't contestable things. And yet the BBC, which is a relatively good news organisation, right? it's, not the, it's not Fox News. We're on the wrong Lawson. We're on the wrong... Oh, it's meant to be Nigella, right? She's a wonderful woman. How the hell? Anyway, that's another, that's another episode of The Fix. If you're watching, I love you, Nigella. But they just, they just allowed him to go on there and say things that were categorically wrong. He was saying actually that, that the world temperature was going down rather than up. Like I said, it's gone up by 0.8 degrees since 1860. This century, we're anticipating climate change of 2 degrees minimum. And if it goes beyond 2 degrees, and we'll talk about this a, a bit later on, I guess. If it goes beyond 2 degrees, 2.5 degrees, that's when we hit real problems. Even though 2 degrees means tens of millions of people having their lives completely screwed up. Because 2.5 goes to 3, to 4, to 5, to 6. We get a, a cascade of feedback, so to speak. And the culmination of which is an atmosphere which is unbreathable because there's so much methane. A world primarily comprised of desert. Uh, and agriculture only really being possible in both the extreme north and south poles. Now, the problem for us is that we don't know how quickly that will transpire. Okay, But what we do know is that there's sufficient element amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that it makes it inevitable. We just don't know when and how far it will go. So how do we, you're saying we have to be concrete, how do we subtract from this then the unknown? Because we don't know the time frame, we don't know the exact consequences, so therefore it is that bit easier for these people to obfuscate and to exploit the sort of liberal imagination which says, well, we can't be certain, so therefore they have to have an opportunity to speak. So there is a wonderful academic called Dipesh Chakrabarti who's done a lot of work on decolonizing the Anthropocene. So the what's, the, what's the Anthropocene? So, yeah. Sorry. Let, let yeah, me yeah, tell yeah. you, Dr. Bastano. Mm -hmm. um, the Anthropocene is basically the idea that we live in a distinct geological period in which human activity on this earth shapes the earth like a geological force. So pre previously we lived in the Holocene, now we live in the Anthropocene. Now precisely what that means when it starts is open to debate. So some people say the Anthropocene begins with the uh, extin extinction of like the great mammals, others say it begins with the Industrial Revolution, some say it only starts in 1945. And what Dipesh Chakrabarti says in Decolonizing the Anthropocene is that while there's so much emphasis on uh, um, the impact of human activity on the earth, it also strangely disempowers us 
because if we start thinking of ourselves as a geological force, well, a geological force doesn't have agency, sovereignty, or purpose. The cumulative effects of human activity in terms of climate change and other forms of pollution, or well, those are purposeful, right? Those are the product of decisions made with agency. Mm. And what's more is that it kind of posits a unified consequence of human activity in this idea of a kind of evenness in terms of, uh, you know, the distribution of responsibility for climate change when we don't have human-wide political solutions for grasping that. And obviously, in terms of causation, um, the... Uh, those who are res most responsible for climate change, like that's not distributed evenly. So Britain historically is the biggest per capita contributor to man-made climate change. Because we industrialise first, right? Because we industrialise first. So one of the things that I would encourage us to think of is to kind of break free of a distancing, liberal, moralising argument about climate change, of like we as humankind must do this, there's a moral case for the world, because obviously that's not working, right? If all we needed for um, you know, human flourishing was a unified sense of what it means to be human, well, colonialism probably wouldn't have happened. So I think we need to make much more concrete cases in terms of improving people's lives in the here and now. I think one of the things that we have to do, and this is something which the anti-racist, post-colonial, decolonial, aka Babin left is very bad at doing, is looking at the role of development in the global south in terms of driving climate change now, right? So in terms of the texts that were coming out around the 70s and 80s, uh, post-colonial texts like development as freedom, et cetera, et cetera, it said- well, Amartya Sen. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so it, it kind of it posited that um, this kind of resource extraction, fossil fuel use, was key to redressing the historical injustice done by colonialism of, of you know, um, stymied economic development. And so we had to play a game of catch up with the global north. I think when you look at polluters like China, like India, or indeed lots of the economic activities going on in Bangladesh, which, um, you know, have absolutely disastrous environmental consequences in terms of uh, arsenic poisoning in the water and salinity intrusion, we have to have a different model of development and justice in the global south, which can acknowledge the continuing legacies of colonialism. So I think reparations has got to be in there. But as part of addressing climate change. As part of addressing climate change. Yeah. And we also, I think, must re-examine the devil's bargain that was made during decolonization, which was the protection of bourgeois capital and um, the kind of unmitigated exploitation of natural resources that we had kind of picked up from European colonization. Right? Mm. That cannot be the political settlement in the global south anymore. Yeah. What I'm saying is that we need um, a form of non-Eurocentric communism. I'm not saying that I'm a Maoist, but maybe I'm a little bit of a mm. Maoist sometimes. Well. I mean, I, I agree with the whole thing about the Anthropocene, because mm -hmm. it's not humans. Humans adopted a certain social system around the early 19th century, which meant the extraction of fossil fuels, which required value to be in motion, which required profit, which required ever more labour to be subsumed, ever more resources to be uh, consumed, uh, an ever greater circulation of goods and services, and that's capitalism. So we should call it the Capitalocene, not the Anthropocene, because it was never determined inevitable that humans were going to adopt that mode of production. So yes, capitalocene, I agree with it. If we're going to talk about the substantive stuff, climate change has to be put within a broader context of um, rising demand globally for energy. So at the moment, humans consume around 15 terawatts every hour, and all of us on the planet have around three kilowatts constantly going. So all, all of us, all 7.2 billion of us, are basically boiling a kettle non-stop. And that's a lot of energy. But the point is it'll probably double between now and 2050 because we're going to add a couple more billion people and pretty much three quarters of the planet has rising expectations. So the left historically has replied to that and said, well, we have to consume less. We need less, you know, we won't be able to take holidays, we won't be able to have nice food, globalised food, you know, supply and so on. Small is beautiful. And I think that's inhibited a sort of populist, green, uh, red politics, which I think has to be set up with development of the global south. So if we talk about solar, for instance, what part of the world gets the most solar energy? Well, it's the equator. 
which is where about, I think, 40% of the world's population lives. The world's poorest countries also happen to have the most potential solar energy. So Nigeria, um, uh, Central, Central Asia, um, Central America, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, these countries with rapidly growing populations often and already very poor could actually uh, benefit from a massive transition to solar, which I think should be paid for through a global carbon tax, which obviously overwhelmingly the global north would have to pay. That's where I would start. Because I think reparations is a great way to do it. Um, I think the global north will decarbonise quite quickly anyway. But the problem is, of course, the global south, because you have those rising populations, you have those rising expectations. And I think, and I think the north should pay the bill for that. And I think that this is where the conversations around decolonising the Anthropocene, this sounds like highfalutin, abstract, distancing academic conversations. And, you know, when you kind of uh, listen to a keynote speech or whatever, it does come across in that way. But it's actually really uh, tangible and um, something which I think we need to get much we need to get better at communicating as the left because I think that with um, tech-driven solutions mm -hmm. that we also need to... You know I love those. You love a tech-driven solution. You know I love technology. I think, like, at heart, I'm a, like, fleeky primitivist. I mm. think I'm just kind of scared of technology. I just want nice nails. Is, mm. that, is that an option? Well, that's technology, right? Oh, fuck's sake. Anyway, what I'm saying is that we have to, I think, look at... A very like Marxian problem here, which isn't just inequalities in distribution, but inequalities in production. Yep. So when you look at the nature of, say, uh, coltan mining right in the Congo and the kinds of political instability and violence was manufactured in order to um, maintain control over coltan deposits, or the pollution that's caused in Bautu from refining rare earths, right? The toxic waste to useful material ratio is something crazy, like ten to one. And these minerals are essential in the production of green tech. It's clear that we've got bigger problems here than just like these are um, unequally distributed. There's an inequality embedded in that production in terms of who bears the environmental cost for developing but green sure, technologies. But that's just an argument for common ownership of those goods in those countries. Yeah, no, there is, which is why I'm saying that we I mean, need... we shouldn't stop mining these things. <laughs> Ideally, we should just get them from asteroids, which is, you know, I mean... wait for the book. Okay, so, I mean... Pending asteroid, what I'm saying... Luxembourg's going... By the way, Luxembourg, two, in 2015, the US government signed... The president, Barack Obama, signed something saying, which it seems to be in breach, actually, of preceding space treaties, that private enterprise can benefit from asteroid mining. Luxembourg's in the process of legislating for this stuff so that business can set up there. It's going to happen, and I'm worried that if the left doesn't get onto these terrains and politicise them, we lose again. And what they do is, how is it going to work, asteroid mining? You're going to have trillions of dollars' worth of mineral wealth. They're not going to bring it all back to Earth and see the market price crash. They'll put the they'll half the price or whatever they do. They'll put all the mines on Earth out of business, and then you set the market price slightly below the marginal cost of producing it on Earth because you have this monopoly. That's how capitalism creates scarcity. So even though we would have one million times more, you know, resources, lithium or you know whatever uh, precious metal you want, we would still have scarcity because capital enforces scarcity. So I'm what desperate I'm, to politicize what, asteroid mining. What I'm saying is decolonize and communize production of minerals pending asteroid mining. Agreed. As a transitional demand. Do you buy that, Mr. Space Communism? You got me. Right, got it. You got me. Okay, so one final question before we cut to a break and then we talk to Joe. Um, is decarbonization possible under capitalism? I'm inclined to think it's not plausible under capitalism. We were having this discussion before the show, which is if it were plausible, it would have happened already. I'm inclined to think that capitalism is very, very bad at long-term thinking. What it is very good at is adapting. So, you know, there's the famous line of capitalist realism, right, which is one taken from Frederick Jameson. It's become easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. I think the most obscene thing is that the world doesn't really end. There are just ever more brutal and degraded forms of existence to which capitalism can adapt and exploit. So in terms of the displacement of... Um, agricultural workers in Bangladesh, that's created a glut of hyper-exploitable labour, right? And so you've got... Where are they going? And so you've got, one, that labour being exploited, like, within the borders of the nation-state still. So you've got rural to urban migration. You have a huge concentration of those kinds of workers in places like Dhaka and Chittagong. And then you've got those who move abroad to find work. And this is where you've got the violence of uh, climate change displacement meeting 
the violence of borders, right? So you've got domestic workers who go to Gulf states, for instance, on temporary working visas. They find their travel documents confiscated and working in conditions of slavery, right? So there's a... Ca- you know, so the kafala system, right? That's what they call it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a... The, you know, capital adapts, right? to human misery. Capitalism profits of human misery. It's an opportunity, not a crisis. You then look at those who are making the dangerous overland crossing through, it's called the Darien Gap. Mm. Did I say it right? Some, I'm sure someone on the internet will tell me if I'm not. Um, which I think is between Colombia and Panama. My geography is terrible, which is why I keep looking to you for reassurance like a child. And you look at those who are making that overland journey, and it's overwhelmingly Bangladeshis and Nepalese people. And you're thinking, shit, like, what are you doing in South America? So I think what we need to do is rather than saying that, well, climate change means the end of the world, it means the end of capitalism, it's like, well, no, the disgusting thing is capitalism continues. Mm. So that sounds really, that's a bummer. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, so like the Rio summit was 25 years ago, and that was like the coming out party. That was like, it became like the salient issue for pretty much every every advanced economy and a few other countries besides, right? Everybody knew about the Rio summit. Climate change became a thing 25 years ago. And yet, the years with the highest single increase in emissions of carbon dioxide, guess when they were? Immediately following the global financial crisis, 2008, 9, 10. So we are doing something. I mean, you, you know, we are, you're seeing greater amounts of wind energy and solar energy in a number of countries and so on. Is it enough? I think in the 21st century, we will eventually move beyond fossil fuels to renewables because of the economics but because it's capitalism it's not happening nearly fast enough and the fact this has been a salient issue for 25 years and it's still not happening with the urgency we need like I say um, if we don't limit this to two degrees warming which will still be a human tragedy and we still need to I mean the demand at Paris was 1.5 to 1.5 to survive and you had the um, African delegations walking out because the commitment to even two percent would render two degrees sorry sorry, two degrees even just shows you how little I know of maths. I'm like, 100%. No, no, I've like, done that before, and then people are like, have a go at me. Degrees yeah. would render vast swaths of the world uninhabitable. Yeah. So already that demand was a bloody and racialized compromise. Mm. I think what um, Trump, in relation to the Paris Agreement, shows us is that the um, you know mechanisms of liberal democracy on an international scale are actually very flimsy. Um, and they are so much more precarious than we ever gave them credit for. Um, you know, there's a great phrase from Marx, uh, from Marx um, between two rights, force decides. Yep. The environmental left has very rarely had force on its side. The state has always had it. And I think we need to start thinking about how do we actually extract and ensure some wins because yep. policy and ratification clearly isn't enough. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. Two degrees is going to screw a lot of people over. Anything more could be the end of uh, human species. On that note, Let's our, cra- break. our crowd funder, and then we'll be speaking, uh, speaking to Joey Glenson immediately following that about goings on the British Army and these, uh, these men who were associated with the far right terrorist organisation. Don't miss out. Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. But for all of the darkness, every cause has an effect. For all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navara Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money, and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarro events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarromedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started. Yeah, we're we back. We're back. Uh, I think this needs to look at me, no? Who am I looking at? I'm looking at him. 
<laughs> it's like John McDonnell on Mars. <laughs> is this the master camera? No, we need to have like revolutionary guy, global like... communism. <laughs> That guy who was like running around looking for the camera while doing a segment on Hurricane Irma on BBC News I late at night. That. Did you see it? Oh my god, it was TV gold. Okay. Can we do that John McDonald thing again? Hold on, which camera am I talking oh, to? Which camera am I talking to? This, one. this one? <laughs> this one? Let me tell you. Theresa May's a fucking prick. <laughs> Get her out. Get Jeremy in. Um, anyway, <laughs> so we're joined, <laughs> we're joined by the one and only Joe Glenston. How are you doing, mate? Not bad, mate. Not bad. Joe or Joey? Joe. Because I've heard you can call say me Joey. Joey. People do say that. I don't want to be like... You can, say, you can call me Joey if you want. I don't mind. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, and uh, for the audience out there, tell us a little bit about yourself. The last 10 years. The last 10 years, I am what uh, Wellington called the common scum of the earth. Um, the lowly soldier. Um, and so I joined the army in 2004 because I was broke, because I'm working class. And for lots of partially economic, partially the ideological stuff. Um, went to Afghanistan, quite quickly figured out it was bullshit, came back from tour, refused to go back, um, ended up um, AWOL for two and a half years in the grand tradition of Vietnam vets running off to Canada or Sweden. I ended up in Australia for a couple of years, came back, politicised, became very publicly anti-war, uh, got locked up for nine months in a military prison, which was all shits and giggles. What's that like? Military? Is that worse than a cat B or a cat A? Is it it's it's it, uh, what's the low? I suppose it's technically a low security prison, right. and in fact, like there were guys in there who had been in both and who were kind of connoisseurs of the of the prison system. And some of them said it was better. Some of them said it was worse. Obviously, <laughs> in the military prison, it's a military regime, so it's familiar. But and you get, I don't. It's, it's a weird one. Like they had different. I like in a in a civil prison, you get locked up for there's more lock up or bang up or whatever they called it. Uh, and in the military prison, there's less of that, but you still get you get fucked around a lot more, and it's. Uh, you have to wear uniform and iron your kit and do certain military things. Tough for people generally, right? I, I presume, or not? W what type of people are in there? Yeah. Um, I've, I mean, tough for people is the screws oh, yeah. and the prisoners, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, the screws were pretty up, unhappy about it. In fact, the screw, like, there's a military prison screws core, and it's all the people who don't want to go to Afghanistan. So they, they rebadged to this uh, military prison thing. They got promoted straight to sergeant, and they never really went anywhere. So it was the guys who really didn't want to die. So they were kind of on side in a way. And they were the kind of guys who were getting towards the end of their careers, and they're like, "I'm not going. I'm not running around in the sand pit anymore. I'm sick of it." Um, so it's interesting. It's interesting. And so since then, what's happened? Um, I came out of jail, went to uni, did uh, international relations, wrote a book, published a book, buy it, Verso Books, um, Soldier Box. It's very good, I'm told. Um, <laughs> and uh, then became a journalist, and uh, that's that's where I am now. And um, so what's the, um, what's the organisation that you work with at the moment? Um, so I'm part of a group called Veterans for Peace, which is a, a UK chapter of an American organisation which came out of the um, anti-Vietnam War movement. These are, the, these are the actual, uh, the guys of that era, these old Vietnam vets, they're amazing, they're, they're so, so cool. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine, Ben, um, who's an ex-SAS guy, founded a British chapter and we're now 500 strong. Um, we, we're active around anti-war issues anti-imperialist issues, um, and we're the biggest democratic veterans organisation uh, in the country. And we're part of this long history of angry soldiers and veterans in, in this country and around the world who do radical things and reject the, the narrative of empire and militarism and the army. So let's talk about this case that came up this week. So uh, five men were arrested, four of whom were serving soldiers, two have since been released, I should say, under a suspicion of terror-related offences. And it's being said that they're associated with a group called, is it National Action? That's right. National Action, who are a far-right organisation, white supremacist organisation. And when this happened, there were, you know, there was the kind of media blackout around it. It d didn't really seem like a massive story. I think that if they happened to have been Muslim soldiers, it would have been a much bigger story. And then there was the kind of um, social media storm, which, which is kind of inversely proportional to the amount of coverage often, um, saying, well, you know, these are white supremacist terrorists. Um, that, you know, this indicates that there is a endemic problem in, re in relation to racism and far right ideology in the military. And this is kind of being sat on as an inconvenient truth. And as someone who, it, this might surprise you, but I've never been in the army, 
Really? I mean, I know I've got the not classic the... soldiers' build. Not, yeah. even the, not even like the CCF, your local cadets or something. Yeah, it's cool. Listen, Everyone I smoked did that. a ton of weed at second. So did we <laughs> in cadets. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I'm not. This is not happening. I did have um, some really good camo trackies though, but that was more of a. I was just a look to serve. Yeah. It was not. What, a... What's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's at Joe J Glenton. Can we just pull up Joe's? Um, you. Can we pull up Joe's <laughs> tweets and then, um, uh, because you had some very pertinent remarks in, in, in relation specifically to this, yeah. and we can track that in a second. Because I wanted to ask, so the way in which this is being framed is that this is indicative of an endemic problem in armed forces culture. Has that been your experience? Has that been something that you've observed? Um, it has. Uh, National Action or a neo, not like a card-carrying mm -hmm. neo-Nazi group, I understand. You, I've in my experience of being in the military and around the military, have occasionally come across neo-Nazis. Um, more often, it's um, different kinds of nationalists, so EDL, people who are enthused by the EDL or the BNP, and probably most commonly far-right kind of loyalist uh, guys from Northern Ireland and Scotland from that side of the orange side of the divide um, who are very um, open about their views. And there's space to do that. There's space to do that in the military because, it, I mean, in a sense... I've come to the conclusion after years of kind of throwing this around my head that in a way the military is a far right organisation, but most commonly it's kind of more na less neo Nazis, more kind of nationalist um, groups like the EDL, BMP. Um, and, and why is that? Those, um, I don't know, maybe I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why. Uh, I guess it's just more accepted. Like neo Nazis probably would stand out more um, because they're so, so far right, not to say the others are that much better, um, but the nationalist stuff is kind of part of the part of the, the DNA of the military. There's, there's, it's kind of allowed to be there and it goes unremarked upon. It's just kind of accepted um, though, those kind of ideas. There's just more, more tolerance for it. And it's also kind of part, part, of, the, it's part of the training, I suppose, the ideas of nation and nationhood. Um, in a, and, and I don't think neo-Nazism quite fits that um, in the same way. We're trawling over uh, Joey's tweets, but yeah. I think the specific That's ones... Really you, embarrassing you had stuff. the back, back the McDonald's workers <laughs> the first one. Trap, so you, can, like... you know he's a good, good, good person, uh, a good human being. Um, so you would say it's defined by a nationalism. So, but what I'm interested in is obviously because you've seen in the last 10 years in particular, mm -hmm. the rise of English nationalism, mm -hmm. the rise of the SNP, which for a unionist Scots a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing changes now in Ireland, the potential unification of Ireland. It's not probable, but it's on the agenda when it was just implausible before Brexit. Yeah. So are these broader political dynamics, uh, imperial decline, coupled with the potential breakdown of the union, uh, a continued erosion fundamentally of a shared British identity, uh, declining prestige in the world and so on and so forth, are these coming together to, are they changing fundamentally those, those dynamics that have always been there of, of the army as a quintessentially nationalist organisation which inculcates far-right values. Sure. I, think, I think when you look at the, the kind of juncture we're at, you have um, a couple of failed wars. We're a failed army. Our army's failed, not, for, not strictly because of the quality of the troops, but the quality of the leadership failed to, to, kept to achieve the aims of the wars. You also have um, a period of capitalist crisis. Um, and most guys who are coming out of the military, this is veterans more than anything, mm -hmm. are coming back to poverty and anger. A lot of these guys um, will come out with some degree of mental health issues. Uh, more, a, a more recently recognised, more in the States, the kind of signature injury of these wars is moral injury, when your morals are kind of fractured, your moral compass is fractured. And I think the conjunction of all those things probably has seen um, a rise, has made the military fertile ground and the veterans community fertile ground for nasty ideas. But at the same time, the other side of that is that some people go the other way and then you see the rise of things like Veterans for Peace, which has a much more progressive agenda. I mean, so I guess a question that I have is there seems to be two impulses um, in the left. And I think one is probably the tendency that I have, which is to address the military from a kind of instinctively anti-imperialist position, one which has looked at the war on terror rather than as failed wars, as kind of successful in the sense of, you know, um, s securing certain resources in terms of um, a never-ending war on terror, both domestically and abroad, which justifies ever more invasive forms of state power, again, both domestically and... Would you say Afghanistan was successful? Well, 
thing is, it's like, by what measure of success, right? Oil prices. You know what I mean? I don't think by any measure, really, that they're... No, I mean, I would, what I'm saying in that regard is that it's all, it becomes its own kind of raison d'etre, right? right? Like, you create an enemy, which you kind of, you know, there's a... Um, it's at the existential heart of what it means to exist in the global north at the moment is mm. to simply not be of that barbarous eastern other. Right. Um, it's also an anniversary of 9-11 today, and so we kind of think of that as this decisive historical break. The thing about that analysis is that it rapidly becomes uh, unmoored from domestic politics. Mm -hmm. So we stop thinking about, well how is it that the army becomes the only option to escape from certain neighbourhoods? Or why is it that that mode of belonging, which is certainly uh, predicated on forms of racialized and gendered violence, like why does that become so appealing? And then indeed, how do we engage with those who have come back um, incredibly damaged by those forms of violence? And then there's the other side of it, right, which is a kind of you know, patriotic protectionist leftism, mm -hmm. which says, well, socialism within this country and a strong military is a part of that and a kind of valorization and a lionization of military participation is a part of that. Um, how, how do we kind of create a conversation between these two things which are often pitted as polar opposites? And you've got a figure like Jeremy Corbyn, who is um, smack dab in the middle of this kind of mm -hmm. ideological contest. Yeah, I mean that, that's a it's a very complex question. Yeah, um, sorry, it was a very rambly one. Very, you know, no, no, no. I mean, there it's very valid, but um, it's called. I mean, how do you? Uh, I'm going to try and boil it. Like, how do you engage? There's two sides to it. How do you engage veterans? Um, I think you have to look at Corbyn's program um, and compare it with the program post 1945, mm -hmm. and go look. This is the nearest thing that is being offered to you. Um, to that, to that original settlement, and, and they, a lot of veterans are still caught up with the idea of uh, lineage in history and the achievements of 1945. Um, so that's one part of it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, that's a big question. I, mean, I don't know if I can just roll out an answer to be honest. Because we just yeah. pulled up uh, Corbyn's snubbing Glastonbury. Yeah. Uh, and that was, of course, on the same day as Veterans Day. Yeah. Um, Which is a completely manufactured new thing. That but it always is, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it always is. The Veterans the, Day particularly. They just come the, up with uh, days. What's the games that... The oh, the Invictus, go Invictus yeah, is, Games. Yeah, where Harry, Harry, who there's a couple of people they've picked out as like the the veterans champions. Johnny Mercer is one mm -hmm. of them. Dan Jarvis is another one, and Harry is another Touring one. Touring Labour MPs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Harry is another one. And they, Harry went up on stage at the Invictus Games for wounded troops and shook hands with George fucking Bush. He was there, the the, the kind of architect of these guys' mutilation, mm -hmm. or one of them. Um, and it, yeah, it's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. But then, there is this whole uh, this ch kind of charity sporting event racket which has grown up, and that's about bolstering support for the military. They, they talk about it as a kind of celebration of our guys. They always frame it as the blokes, mm. but the, and then they, they go and by which we mean the men and the women. It actually says that on the Help Hero site: the blokes by which we mean yeah. the men and the women. Um, and it's it's really cynical, twisted. Have you seen the stuff. Millie, the Millies? Maybe we can oh, pull up. Sorry, this is a bit. God, they have like the best sniper award. And this all is this bad. Shit. Yeah, this is bad for me to the production team. But this, the Sun have this um, this Millies. They call it the military Oscars. Have you seen this? Mm. This is like the apotheosis of what's fucked yeah, up. In it's Britain. the Sun. It's the Sun yeah. runs it as well. I mean, it's interesting that you brought up um, the blokes, right? Because there was a report carried out in I think 2015. Um, which was addressing sexual harassment in the military. Oh, Jesus Christ almighty. Um, <laughs> it's bad, huh? Fuck but me. It found that four out of ten of female personnel in the army had received unwanted sexual comments or exposed to material of a sexual nature. 19% um, of women had received unwelcome sexual gestures. 36% had been sent sexually explicit material like pornography or whatever. And just 3% of um, unwanted sexual advances were ever reported. So we talk about the racialized aspect, and I think that's incredibly important. But in terms of um, gender violence, both in terms of what happens when uh, military is posted abroad, but also internally as well, mm -hmm. is there a culture of what is often called toxic masculinity? Absolutely. That's absolutely the case. And I've only come to recognize that more recently. So I've, I, for years I was like, what is this tox toxic bit there? But uh, it's absolutely the case, um, and the army is riddled through it, with it. Well, like my corps, for example, part of, uh, some parts of the military don't have women. Mm -hmm. Mine did, and they were routinely um, 
slurred and slandered and abused uh, in various ways. Um, and it's just absolutely standard practice, in my experience, um, across the military and talking to women who've been in the military. That was there. And it's a weird thing that, that men who are in the military don't get is that women appear, when I've spoken to women veterans in the US and here, women in the military exist in a constant state of kind of sexual threat. They're constantly under, this is their words, not mine. They, they could explain it much more um, coherently. But there are, there's this constant, they know they're in a man's space a hyper male space throughout the whole time. And that obviously is extremely damaging while they're in and afterwards. So when you were um, posted in Afghanistan, right, mm -hmm. how did people that you worked alongside make sense of the war that they were in? Uh, this is it, you, you don't, because you're not, you're not, you're told not to. It's not your job, it's not, it's not in your pay scale. Um, you don't need to think about that, just crack on with the job in front of you. And so in that sense, it's kind of compartmentalized. It is not, I, as private scumbag Glenton, it's not my job. It's my job to worry about getting this load of ammunition from here to here. It's not my job to think about the geopolitics of Central Asia. Um, and that it's, and for a lot, most people that remains the case, um, where that's someone else's concern. And you just concentrate on your own little job uh, across the military. For some people that, and I suppose I'm one of them, that cannot be sustained. And I did start to question, but then when you do, you're in a, a world of fucking hurt to be honest, because you can't go and debate these things. And um, so even though it was obvious as the, we were in the, there in the first stages of like the second Afghan war, Helmand mm -hmm. and Kandahar, even though it was very obvious that from within about two months that it was going very badly and no one really knew what we were doing, um, there was still no space to, to question that. Because we talked about this um, before the show started and I, I kind of think that would be a really valuable thing for our audience to hear about as well, is that you were talking to me about the difference between a professional army and a conscripted army and mm -hmm. what that means in terms of people questioning the situations that they find themselves in mm -hmm. and um, not complying. Yeah, yeah. Um, since Vietnam and, and world, for, for us it's more World War I because we never had Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam for the Americans, um, the US and UK for example, are terrified of they cannot even countenance the idea of a conscript army because it is a virtual guarantee, guarantee of some kind of rebellion on a large scale. And so we opt for professional armies, um, volunteers, um, generally on the, that, there's other kinds of conscription, obviously there's economic conscription, um, because um, they know the kind of radical potential that those big forced, big forced forms of military service hold. Um, and that's a terrifying thought for them. So is there potential to, this is very dangerous saying this as a Muslim, is there potential to radicalize people in UK armed forces to politicise them and to, uh, you know, open up what can be, a, you know, we talked about the inability of the left to deal with soldiers, but mm -hmm. to open up a conversation. I think there is. I mean, the right are doing it, clearly. The right can do it, and I don't see why we can't. And there are, you know, the military is a weird thing because it is uh, very reactionary in many ways and very right-wing, and it's about power and submission. But at the same time, in a weird way, the military also has... It almost has the kind of germs of something else because there's a huge, in its own way, it relies on solidarity with each other. You still operate in a team, even if it's um, in a way that would be hard to kind of digest for the left. Um, but also, you look at the military and it's a planned economy. Everyone's fed and clothed and watered and educated to some extent and employed in what the establishment would suggest is a useful way. So there are germs of something else as well. And that kind of solidarity, which is very intense, and it obviously, often in the military, is described in a very masculine way. It's like the brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something of a value there, I think. But it depends which way it goes and if it can be expanded in a more progressive and meaningful way. I mean, people talk about this, don't they, in terms of the selflessness, that people, when they're fighting alongside one another in a high, yeah. sort of high-pressure situation, they're doing it for their, their mates exactly. rather than a, you know... Their comrades. Queen and country, yeah. Yeah, and, yet you, be, and you can see how... So if you could... Uh, kind of create something like that on the left, um, it would, uh, dis hopefully it could potentially dispense with some of the fracturing, the kind of fractious nature of the left. I just think there is some potential there, some kind of example, a deeply imperfect, flawed example, because obviously the, the military is very good at um, giving you, kind of ingraining this team ethic and this solidarity in you, and then they say, now go and kick fucking Iraqi's doors in. And so, so it's kind of, they build this solidarity, this human bond, and it's a very human thing, and then they use it for their own ends to dominate other countries uh, and abuse people and extract resources. 
But there is something in there which I think is of value, could be of value to us. We're going to wrap up in a second. Oh, wanna... I've got a question. Go on, you ask a question and then I'll, you know, yeah. It's another biggie, which is, this is a point of antagonism in the left at the moment. And you've got those like Paul Mason who think that this isn't a useful conversation to have right now. So you kind of accept some of the limitations of, you know, expansionist nationalism. But do you think that we can and indeed should be working towards building a social majority, a cultural hegemony, whatever you want to call it, um, towards building a disarmed and demilitarized society. What are your strategies for that? Do you think it's possible? I think it is possible and I think we should attempt it. And one idea which is flowing around um, fellow dissenters, me and fellow dissenters, is the idea of neutrality, of Britain being neutral. And by that I do not mean defenceless, which is what the right would obviously respond. If we're neutral, we're defenceless. But I do mean a non-expeditionary, a country which doesn't do expeditionary warfare in the way that it has. And that means not necessarily disbanding the army, uh, well, not disbanding the army and not being defenceless. And in that, that might be a way that would appeal, because we talked about this earlier, there are large sections of the right who question and reject the arguments for us being in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and that also, the more traditional kind of anti-war left in the peace movement, that would probably also, also appeal to them. So maybe there's potential there. But this idea, and I'd encourage people to explore what neutrality, national neutrality actually means. Um, and look at that and see if there's some a kind of radical programme which can emerge from that that we can consider um, campaigning on. What do you yeah, think? I think, well, Paul, Paul Mason's sort of, his, when he stands for nuclear weapons, you know, he's a big fan of Trident. He says he is a fan of Trident because he wants to eliminate an expeditionary uh, army, effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, well, look, we, uh, we want to save money, we want to put money elsewhere, we don't want to invade foreign countries, so keep Trident and get rid of the other bit. I can see the logic there. I don't know if I agree, but I can certainly see the logic there. And I, I think I, I would agree in terms of the, the neutrality thing, and you would maintain some kind of armed forces, clearly for defensive purposes. Um, in a context where Donald Trump has nuclear weapons, where Kim Jong-un has nuclear weapons... Uh, well, I think we will only see the further proliferation of nuclear weapons in the next several decades. I think unilateral disarmament maybe is a limited strategy. I believe, I mean, and this is a difficult thing to say because every schmuck in the Labour Party in pro said, well, I believe in multilateral disarmament, but it's a cover for not really believing mm. in disarmament whatsoever. But I think now, as more and more countries have access to these weapons and this technology and this knowledge, it, it, you know, we, we really have little other choice. We have to. And to underline the fact... I believe that. I would add, I, you know, I would say there's no other great miracle in the second half of the 20th century, as I said last week, actually, than the fact we didn't have a nuclear war after 1945. And it is a miracle. It's a fantastic thing. And unless we do something about it, I think it probably will happen at some point. And hundreds of millions of people will die. So I'm not saying it should be ignored, uh, but it would have to be addressed at the multilateral level. What Britain can do unilaterally, and this is perhaps where I agree a bit with Paul, is the expeditionary warfare stuff. I mean, I would... In fact, frame things in a slightly different way, but and I think you see this in an especially pronounced way in in America, where the technologies and tactics of the war on terror have been brought back domestically, in particular to police black and Latino communities, and I think that there is a strong argument to be made in terms of the protection of civil liberties, and indeed in terms of domestic anti-racist movements, which haven't always lined up that productively with a kind of, you know, international anti-imperialism and making connections between these kinds of technologies of violence. And it's something that the Black Panthers did incredibly well. So going back to Vietnam is that it took the language of anti-imperialist opposition to warfare and connected it to issues like poor housing, like mass incarceration, like police violence. And I think that when you look at the political moment that we're in, in the UK, where I think well, there's been this kind of wonderful confluence between Corbyn's Labour Party and, you know, politically engaged, in particular, young people of colour, young working class people of colour in urban centres, that's something that we can work on quite productively. And can I just say, I really don't want there to be a nuclear war, because I want to have, like, 11 babies. I want, like, a football <laughs> team of babies. Can I just say, it's not just the technologies as well, it's, it's the literal kit. Yeah, yeah, right? that's what I meant, not yeah, just yeah. like metaphorical technology, yeah, it's more yeah, like tech-tech. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like the, the actual kit that's used in these theatres of war 
is uh, you know at reduced cost and given to various yeah. you know um, police forces. I think one one example is Steven Seagal in his American <laughs> series Lawman. Uh, there's a video of Steven Seagal with who is this guy that was uh, let off by Trump recently? Joe yeah, uh, Arpaio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. I can't remember. There's, if you go on YouTube, Arpaio Seagal. He's like, what's going on in the Arizona? And it's like, our power's from like the north, right? Arizona's like a borderland with Mexicans, as you're saying. And it's purely for the cameras. They, they basically like drive a tank through like a chicken farm. Mm. And it's like, they were cockfighting, like they were breeding chickens for cockfighting. It's like, this is <laughs> unreal. And it wouldn't happen to a white American. Oh, it could, but it's highly unlikely. And, and this was a perfect example, albeit a very funny one. Not for the gentleman involved, of course, but. And yeah, I think it's a way of rendering these demands tangible. Because I think that, and we saw this with the nature of the anti-war movement in 2003, is that these things had a limited amount of mass participation, but it felt so distant, that cognitive dis distance with the war on terror. Few people cried. Most people were silent. In terms of saying, well, the threat's here, there's a fifth column of Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they were operating on a different kind of terrain. Um, and I think that there's a way to bring that back and not cede that ground to the right. We, can we get, because I just saw Lawman come up. Can we cut to Lawman with the sound? Wouldn't that be amazing? Steven Seagal <laughs> was, I was listening to Chapo Trap House and they were saying how, oh, is this it? Oh yeah, 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 can we get the sound on? Oh my God. Is this, is the sound on? There he is, the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> the fifth column. There's Seagal, look, with Joe Arpaio. <laughs> and they, they bust up like a chicken farm. And they kill a puppy, I think. <laughs> Just and, to make it. <laughs> and this is like regular law enforcement in the US and they've got like snipers and like, it's, cr it's yeah, unbelievable. But then, you, but then you look at the presence of the National Guard in Ferguson and you, you know, you look at how they're kitted out. I mean, these aren't, you know, we're not just talking about kind of metaphorical resonances here. Yeah. It's like, um, it's something that's really immediate. I, I had really good friends who were on the, the big, uh, the Native American protest, the pipeline. Um, uh, the d no D A P L. No D A P L. They, they, were, they were out there. Some of them were some of them were um, First Nations people, but loads of uh, loads of veterans went there, obviously, and they found themselves on a kind of picket line, faced with all the kit that they used in wow. Afghanistan. Like looking at it, these were guys in the, in uh, the Viet, VFP America, but it was just. They were stunned by the fact that all the bomb-proof vehicles that they were given and the rifles and the sniper rifles and the drones and the sound weapons and the stuff they would have used yeah. uh, on operations was suddenly pointed at them. This was the, you know, they, went, they switched sides and, and found themselves staring down the barrel. Bloody hell. I remember those, well, we, we should cut this in a sec, but uh, there's a book by a guy called Frank Kitson. Mm. who was, a, I think, a brigadier a monstrous in creature. Burma. Yeah, he, and he masterminded the Northern Ireland. Exactly, and yeah. the, this is the book that basically encapsulates some of the logic behind that. It's called Low Intensity Operate, or Countering Low Intensity Insurgency. Yeah. And the book is just unreal because he's it's written in the early 1970s and he's saying, look, the things we've learned in Burma, the things we've learned repressing colonial conflicts, mm -hmm. we're now having to use Northern Ireland and we'll have to use them on the British mainland. He looks like that kind of guy. Yeah, well, and he, no, but he explicitly says, and we'll have to use them on the British mainland this decade, and of yeah. course with urban riots, mm. primarily centred around people of colour in uh, Toxteth and Brixton in the 80s, yeah. and we see that carrying on, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's prophetic in a way. Yeah, this, and this is what gets me, I mean, one of the big issues around the veterans community now is kind of legacy prosecutions for Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a lot of stuff about that, mm. and then Northern Ireland, and they, it was always the case that, even down to the Marine A case, where this mm. Marine executed a, and he, like, he went down and should have gone down, to me, mm. that's, that's my view. Um, but it, it's always, there's a phrase in the army, shit rolls downhill. It's never a Kitson. It's always Lance Corporal Scumbag or Sergeant Scumbag. It's never the guys at the top. It's never at the level of senior command or the, the executive level. It's never Tony Blair. It's always Private Jones. Uh, and, and Kitson is a classic example. That he's, still, he's still kicking. I think he's in his 90s now. Yeah, he's, yeah, still, yeah. he's the architect of this brutal, brutal campaign in Northern Ireland based on these other brutal campaigns yeah. he conducted in Burma and Malaya and and then Kenya, who's involved in the Kenya, I think. Um, but th those guys just keep on kicking. Like it, in, it all rolls downhill to these, uh, Brit, to these guys. Brits don't know about this, but like in Malaya, uh, maybe, it, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, in Malaya, they literally forced people, like half a million people were moved into purpose-built yeah. cities. They, which they called concentration mm. camps. Yeah. They so called, they could monitor them. Yeah. And it's like, they, they like half a million people. Do you yeah. not get me started wow. on the failure wow. of 
Britain to uh, reckon with its colonial past because we've got, yeah, I mean, yeah. we but could have a whole like, hour long This isn't like the 19th century, right? Like no. you say, the guy's still it's alive. It's living memory. The guy's living literally still alive. I, a good friend of mine, Walter, was there. He was a 17-year-old Coldstream guardsman taking, burning these people's food, taking them off the land. He's in his 80s now. Amazing guy. He lives in London. We should um, get him on. No, he's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, Walter. And he, uh, no, he was there. He was involved in all this stuff and he was, um, he breaks down like 40, 50 years on or whatever it is. Now, um, and he took you know they were, they were they had bounties for heads, they they had um, there are the tribesmen, of Dayak, like, yeah. tribesmen, yeah, yeah, and they had there's a, there's a shocking image of a, of a royal marine with a head, and they would take bounties, and they would, the guys were encouraged to take the heads of the communist insurgents. Oh, of course, it was all naturally about Dunlop mm. rubber, um, and they would get a bounty from like the local council. Take your head down, to the local council, and we'll pay you however much in the local currency. Savage. Well, we have to get Joey back on. Yeah. Don't we? I'm around. And this has been like the best discussion on easy. like leftist international relations and geopolitics that I've had in a really long time. Thank you. <laughs> and your book is, what's it called again? Soldier Box. Buy it. It's awesome. It's with Verso Books. <laughs> Who am I looking at? Which camera? <laughs> 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 Buy it. We'll, we'll, get Joey, we'll get Joey back on and then the legend Harry Leslie Smith wants to come. Soldier thing. Do you know something? I think like Buy it. I think it's because I never knew my granddad. I feel this intense sense of affinity with Harry Leslie Smith. I just kind of want him to give me no. some like life he's, advice. And I think he's filled that space that Tony Benn used to occupy when Tony Benn passed away. He's like the old wise lefty dude. Yeah. For me, that's how I look at Harry he's, Leslie Smith. Mate. Me and my, it's like me the Gandalf figure. Me and my friend call him um, Teflon White Man because it's like because <laughs> it's like <laughs> the reason I call him Teflon White Man is because he's like, listen, I fought in World War Two. It's like ah, so you're down with like you know expansionist imperialism. He's like, no. Yeah. Um, it's great. It's just like he's like kind of love that guy. It's perfect. Love that guy. We love you, Harry. He is a treasure. Yeah, we'll get Harry Leslie Smith on. There you go. Absolute don. Absolute. Boy. My grandfather, Abs Harry Leslie Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see the resemblance. Um, <laughs> no, he's a don. He's a, he's an absolute dynamo. We'll get him back on. Joey, what a gem. Cheers, mate. What nice a treasure. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Um, Cheers. I'm gonna. See. Which one? Oh, Jesus. This one. No, oh, that was a, it was a joke. It was like the McDonald <laughs> thing. Um, Fantastic. Well, we'll be talking more about globalisation and global warming and the failure of uh, market capitalism to provide a solution for climate change. I think it's one of the things we've under-discussed on Navarro. We've obviously talked about it enough, but it's, uh, it's, it's probably the big crisis of this century. So more of that, certainly more of Joey. And Ash. more of the 11 children that I'm going to have. More of the 11 children. Those are the Navarro editors, circa 2045, <laughs> whatever, once we, you know, we hit. Single. Uh, <laughs> was that? That's my, that's my granddad you're talking about. <laughs> They'll be the editors in 2045 once we hit post scarcity. Uh, the Fix will be back next Monday. Uh, we are live at TWC and Labour Party conference later this month. And of course, Navarra FM returns on Friday. Uh, well, we'll see you soon. <laughs>